Okay, so uh, we're on to our next session, uh, the final one before lunch. Uh, Jan Muller is the CEO of the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. Um, since ACME began, uh, we have had a partnership with the, the NFSA um, through the Australian Media Tech. Um, we've been collaborating on retrospectives, uh, on research collaboration. We um, partnered together to screen wonderful um, retrospectives. Uh, we also screen their beautiful uh, restorations of films. We just had uh, My Brilliant Career here on Thursday night with Gillian Armstrong, which was fantastic. And um, over the last couple of years, the NFSA's Melbourne team um, have lived with us at Acme X. So, you know, we work very, very closely, but um, as each of our institutions and our functions and roles and ambitions are evolving, uh, we need to change then how our collaboration works. And that's um, both exciting and challenging. Um, we're really excited uh, to have Jan here in Australia at the helm of the NFSA. Um, the wealth of experience he brings um, from his time in Europe, uh, most recently as the CEO of the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision, but also as chair of Europeana, is um, going to be really valuable for us, I think, in the sector here, um, and demonstrating that collaboration is so vital uh, to, to preservation. So please make Jan welcome to give his presentation. Thank you, Katrina. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, before I'll um, give you my presentation and print you my slides, I would like to start with a video clip. A video clip actually that shows what digital preservation is all about, about the challenges, but also about the great opportunities that digital preserved work uh, could deliver to us. Um, can we please start a clip? We are the stories we tell ourselves. The world is filled with incredible objects and rich cultural heritage. And when we get access to them, we are blown away. We fall in love. <coughs> bringing people face to face with our objects is a way of bringing them face to face with people across time, across space. Today, it can feel like things are happening too fast so fast that it can become really difficult for us to form an understanding of our place in history. We are in such a critical moment of our collective history. Who thinks about what to do with web video? Who thinks about how to deal with interactive documentaries, games, for example? We have got to be innovative. We've got to be competitive. We've got to be productive. We've got to be on the balls of our feet. Innovation is not about solo genius. It's about collective genius. What we now have are the building blocks to a very exciting future when it comes to accessibility to arts and culture. We could actually achieve the great vision of everything available to anybody in the world that's ever wanted to have access to it. The real impact and value of what we do when we digitise our stuff is when people use it. History can only be told from the records that survive or are preserved. We need to future-proof the memory of the world. I believe collections like this can change people's lives. Thank you. That last quote was Sean Angelis, who is an um, Aboriginal man from Central Australia, a rancher community, working for the Strelo Research Institute. And the Strelo Research Institute brought a part of their collection to, uh, to the NFSA. Um, he was doing his research there in our place. And um, one day he came to me with a, with a hard disk with, with footage on it and footage that he researched that he found, and he, wa he was really emotional because he said, I found two hours of footage that I didn't know it even existed. It was in, in the collection, it was digitized material that he could see. And um, he said, you know, this, this material gives me the opportunity to teach my people, my community, the younger people, 
water ceremonies in the 50s, materials from the 50s, from the 1950s, made by the anthropologist Ted Strello, um, what the cere ceremonies in these days were like. And he says it, it fills in the gaps for us. And I think that's, the end of the day, what the role of an archive should be, to fill in the gaps, to keep memories alive, to help us remember, that's what we do. And it was a great example of, you know, this, this makes sense, this really makes sense. In that clip you heard, you heard people saying about things like, it's huge, it's, things are happening too fast, um, you know, the beautiful material you fall in love with, it, it's quite a, well, it's an obligation, it's, it, it's quite big, it's huge. It means, and, and that's probably um, where this presentation um, uh, will be about is, it needs to be done in collaboration. We need to collaborate in, in, in keeping that memory alive and, and safeguard our collective memories. Um, otherwise, we'll never make it because indeed it's, it's big and it's getting bigger. We hear it all the time now. It's, it's not just film. It's not just traditional sound film broadcast, uh, traditional audiovisual. It's also the new media, the multimedia that we need to preserve for future purposes. So it's huge. And um, again, this will be about collaboration. Um, I realized that I only got 24 minutes. I got 54 slides for you. It means 24 seconds uh, per slide. So don't blink. Um, but it's just before lunch. So we, we might speed up a little bit, but it might be good. So I'll drag you to lunch. Bear with me. Um, to start with, a little bit about the NFSA, because you might want to know what, what our vision and mission is all about. So we are the National Film and Sound Archive, and we say the future of audiovisual archives is digital. Well, I think that makes sense at a conference about digital preservation. It is about digital, period. You know, this is a no-brainer. We talk about digital here. And we envision the NFSA to be smart, connected, and open. Smart in terms of the knowledge that we use the, the, and that we need for future purposes, the technology we need. You know, big archives like the NFSA and... and, um, and big data actually needs to um, be um, accessed in a smart way. We need technology, we need uh, automated machine learning tools and so on, because otherwise we'll, we, we are not an archive, because if we can't describe the material, it doesn't simply exist. So smart in terms of technology, knowledge, skills and so on, connected, and that's probably where it's all about today, it's uh, connected in terms of collaboration with others, connected with users, connected with other institutions, other archives. An archive should do it, shouldn't do it things on, our, on its own anymore. Uh, and we need to be open, open as a no-brainer as well for an archive. An archive that is locked, even when it's beautifully digitized and preserved, uh, doesn't exist. So it needs to be open <coughs> because you need to create impact and, and be relevant for society. That's our long-term approach. Our daily business is, is about the, these three words. It's about to collect, to preserve, and to share our audiovisual heritage here in Australia. And if you would describe that in a mission, it says, we collect, preserve, and share our national audiovisual collection, past, present, and future. So not just the traditional film and sound, but also the future of audiovisual heritage in order for others to learn, experience, and create with it. And I think these three words are the most important here because to learn, experience, and create means it's active, it's engaging, it should be interactive. People need to work and to play with the archives as well. Um, that's important. So an, 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 an open, a connected, and um, engaging archive makes sense. Um, we've, we've heard the words genius, uh, the, uh, the word geni genius before today. Um, I think um, um, Ben and Asti were talking about it. You don't need to be a genius anymore. No, that's right. Because you, when you do things in collaboration, it makes sense. You create that collective genius that is important. So this is one of our internal statements that we use when we talk about how to collaborate. It's, it's creating collective genius. Working together with institutions, with archives, with museums, but also with universities, makes sense in order to create the knowledge that you need to make it all happen. Um, we say we don't do things on our own anymore at the NFSA. Every project at least should encapsulate um, collaboration. There are partnerships in everything we do. 
And what we also say is we want to put the N back into the NFSA. And when I presented it a couple of weeks ago to a group, someone thought it's the N from the Netherlands because it's orange. No, it's the N from national. Um, put the national back into the NFSA. We are a national agency, and that makes sense. We need to safeguard the national audiovisual heritage collection of this country and make sure that it's accessible and that it can be used. And again, the future of audiovisual archives in that way should be smart, connected, and open. Just briefly to, um, to show you what our priorities are all about in the coming years, these are the priorities that we defined recently. Five key priorities, strategic key priorities for our future, starting with the obvious one, just to digitize the collections that we have. That I would say it's a no-brainer as well, but it comes with a lot of money, a lot of budgets, a lot of resources. It needs to be done. That's why we define it as key priority number one. There's another key priority that is related to the digitization, and that is establishing the National <coughs> Center of Artificial Heritage for this country, meaning this is the place where we collectively digitize our material, where we take care of the storage together, starting with the national institution. This is where co collaboration should start in order to safeguard that audiovisual heritage. <laughs> Number three is to build our national profile. That's an internal focus, and mainly, um, and this comes with the fact that I believe that an archive should be visible and usable, it should reach out, should be active, engaging, meaning that we need to be visible as an archive, meaning that we We'll do exhibitions again, um, even when it's been closed, our exhibition space for a couple of years now. Uh, we need to invest in being visible, and being visible as an archive means create visibility for that beautiful audiovisual heritage that we have. Number four is the thing that, um, that has been discussed before today. This is an important future target for us, to make sure that we collect, preserve, and share the multimedia and new media of this, of this country as well. And that's what Katrina just uh, briefly touched upon as well. It's, it's, it's done in collaboration. We're not saying that we are the archive where everything will be found. And Nick, you said something like a distributed network, and I think that's the case here. We should work in networks, and I will give you some examples of my past in the Netherlands and in Europe about how that could work and what it could deliver to us. So working in networks, meaning Everyone takes care of their own specialism, their own skills, and their own expertise, and we'll, together we make sure that it happens. Number five is about um, redefining our physical, physical presence, uh, actually meaning we need a new building. You've seen that picture of that beautiful Art Deco building in Canberra from 1934. Actually, it's the former, uh, uh, former Australian Institute of Anatomy, which means it is practically, uh, it used to be a morgue, not an archive, not a museum. Uh, we need a new place, especially when it comes to ambitions like this. And there's something completely different. I won't tell you about it today, but it's an interesting um, project for our near future as well. Um, I think when you talk about digital preservation, you actually talk about this statement. Um, no, it doesn't last forever. If you digitize your collections, it only just begins because it's about migration of standards, of, of formats. Um, it will change every day. So people who think now, we, now we're digital, we're there, now we only just begin. This is, this is an interesting way to describe it. Um, it's changing all the time, and you need to be aware of that. So that comes with, uh, again, resources, but also collaboration to make, make that work, and to make this work, because this is what we do as well. <laughs> we should preserve both the analog and the digital file. So both the analog object and the digital file. Um, in a nutshell, this is what we do. And that's why we want to establish that National Center of Excellence, meaning actually that we take care, jointly working together with other institutions of our shared collections to digitize it, to make sure that it's stored properly, that it's well described, that it's accessible, and that we can <coughs> use and reuse the material, um, including everything audiovisual, actually. And why? The answer is simple, I would say, because our history is at risk. And that needs preservation planning, because it's about large numbers. This is about mass digitization, which means how would we treat the, the final result of everything we digitize? What, what, is the, what is the accepted level of what we digitize? How would we reuse the materials? Well, 
most and ninety five percent of the reuse of of digitized material is actually based on these little screens that we call smartphones or tablets or computers, and maybe a television screen, um, which means that good enough in mass digitization mostly is good enough. We don't need to digitize it at the highest, 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 highest level. Make sure that what we do through mass digitization can work for 95 or maybe even more um, percent of all, the, of all the usage. And if there's someone who needs it at these, these highest, highest standards, there will be digitization on demand available with all the professional equipment that we have as well. But if we talk about make it happen, make sure that all these numbers, and I will get back to that later, we want to make it happen, mass digitization means good enough is good enough. At the end of the day, the National Center of Excellence should lead to this shared, trustworthy digital repository, something that we build in the Netherlands already, together with the National Archives, with, together with film, uh, uh, iFilm uh, Museum, together with the National Library, and so on. Make sure that you store things together, because this is just back office-related work. It doesn't, this doesn't influence our brands or our positioning. This is just actually daily business. Make sure that we do at least things like this in collaboration. It's, it's not easy because it takes a lot of work and resources and money as well. But at least if you are in a place that the entire audiovisual heritage of one country, and I think in Australia it would be possible to do it that way as well, that National Centre of Excellence could lead to this. And it's not the only National Centre of Excellence and more centres of excellences. ACME has its preservation centre of excellence as well. But imagine what happens if these networks could work together and deliver something like that. Um, what we need to do together is at least together invest in knowledge and innovation. We need to understand how access and use is meant, what, what people need, what, to, what sort of context they, they expect from us. Um, humanities and digital humanities mainly could use it as a brilliant source of everything they research. Audiovisual material uh, representing the current history of this country. It's, it's a great database as well for researchers. Obviously, we need to know everything about digitization and dis uh, digital sustainability, about metadata, about machine learning and stuff like that, but also about what the users want. What, what do the users expect from an archive? How would, they, how would they use that material and reuse it? So we need to invest in, in these things before we um, know what to digitize and how. And again, partnering is essential. Don't do things on your own anymore. And uh, an example from the Netherlands, from my own former institute, the, in the uh, Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, we had this great uh, project um, between 2007 and 2014, where we digitized the entire artificial collection, at least the things that really mattered, of the Netherlands. And it, as you can see, this was a sort of networked uh, project program as well with uh, not only us, but also the National Archives, iFilm Museum, and the Royal Library. <coughs> and we managed to digitize these numbers. And that 1,900 hours must be 1,900,000 one, one th one hours, because otherwise we would have ended it in two years, probably. Um, but this is what it, what it brought. And um, again, um, being able to digitize on a large scale, in this case, in a period of seven years' time, enabled us to reach out to much more communities with our digitized material and reuse was growing exponentially. So it makes sense to do these things. This costed money, obviously. This was a project that um, costed about 150 million, 150 million Australian dollars. Um, again, that was in 2007. Um, we're 11 years further down the road, which in, in the digital world is a long, long time. I think it should be and it will be cheaper now, uh, given the technology that is in place. But again, this, this is it pretty massive, but it works and it's important. In, the, in uh, Australia, we're, we're talking about collaboration on that scale with the national uh, institutions and ABC, for example, to um, talk about digitization together. To, so this center of excellence could start with these uh, participants. We're talking to them. Um, we share the idea of um, creating a National Centre of Excellence. It will take some time for all of us to understand what it would bring. It's early days, but this could be the start of that. 
and it makes sense again because what I said in the beginning it is about huge numbers it is it is enormous these are uh, examples of the uh, of the formats that we need to digitize together and it's it's over 60 formats that means 60 different workflows 60 different machineries that you need to build and when it comes to um, deterioration it's not just the film or the material or the or the video or the audio files the, or the um, of the objects that that got lost because of deterioration it's also the the knowledge that is dying literally the machinery that's that that we lost um, so for example when we when we digitized part of the radio collection in in the Netherlands uh, radio broadcast collection that was based on DAT, you can see it over there, DAT, digital audio tapes, small tapes um, in a period used in a period between mainly 1990 and let's say 2000 <laughs> in radio and um, there were no machines anymore. We couldn't play them because there were lots, lots of these tapes but no machines to play them anymore. We needed to go to Siemens in Germany, bring the machines to the Netherlands, the last original 10 machines including all the spare parts and make it work. That's what's happening as well. It's not just the material; it's also the machinery and the knowledge that is uh, that is uh, that we're losing. So it is urgent. And again, this is about numbers. So to give you an example, what the national collection would be if it um, if we digitize it, you can you can see it here. This is based on the partners that I showed you here. So this is what we cut together. 848,000 hours of material of which still 55% needs to be digitized and of that 55% meaning 464,000 hours it's about 60% audio and 40% 41% um, video that's what we're talking about so compared to the Netherlands situation that that seven years program in Holland that um, led us to what was it four or five hundred thousand hours total and uh, 1.2 million pictures it's pretty similar to this it's huge it's big and again this should be done in collaboration and to even stress the importance of it this is a um, um, picture that shows that we are running out of time actually because you can see that it's not just deterioration uh, of the material which is a pretty linear process, but also the, um, the fact that we will lose technology simply because it doesn't exist anymore. So this is actually a way to, to stress the urgency, which means that we defined our deadline 2025 program internally and together with the other partners as well, by the way. But internally, this means for us, if we need to deliver on our part of the digitization <laughs> between now and 2025, because that's where the machinery and the material and the knowledge will be gone. We need to upscale our capacity from, let's say, 10,000 digitized items per year to 40,000 items per year, so four times the capacity that we have now. And it all comes with money and it all comes with resources and we don't have money and we don't have the resources, so again, this needs to be done in collaboration. It's, it's pretty obvious. Um, another thing, we're talking about digitization, but actually it's not about digitization or preservation at all. It is, in my opinion, about what you do with your collections, because still digitization is a sort of hygiene factor for Argos nowadays, nowadays to, to make sure that we can even use and access that material. So it's about what you do with your collections, and we're always on, meaning material will always be used, it will always be in bed. It's not the best uh, possible um, uh, material probably and it doesn't matter because we're all always in better it's just using the material as soon as you can and I'll give you an example of Europe in this case Europeana and I've been chair for a year and a half before I moved to Australia for this beautiful platform this beautiful initiative in, in Europe and um, well we bluntly say we transform the world with culture but in fact it is what it is this this happens in Europe um, 28 member countries of the European Union sharing all their digitized material in one platform and it's still just the top of this audiovisual heritage iceberg. It's only 10% that's digitized, uh, about 300 million objects. This is the entire audiovisual, no, the entire heritage collection of, of Europe. So it's huge, it's really huge. Um, 
But this is what we, what we did with that first 10%, or actually just a part of that. Um, we created that multi-sided platform focusing on end users, the audience, um, creatives for creative reuse of the material, and the professionals. And these three make sense, end users focusing on you know, information that they need for whatever topic available on, on, um, on Europeana. Um, things that they can share, because people want to share things nowadays, they want to like things nowadays, they want to comment on things nowadays, so this enables them to do that with digital heritage of the, of the continent. Beautiful. This is an example of Europeana 1940-1980, very popular website that we created regarding First uh, uh, World War in, uh, in Europe. Um, beautiful is not the right word, but you know what I mean. This is, this is great. It's enormous number of materials that is, has been used here and presented. The creatives, they want to develop things with heritage. It's not just researching it or looking at it or using it for whatever. It's, 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 it's recreating things through the European labs, as we called it, um, where material can be reused for other purposes. And this is an example of how European labs look like <coughs> and what you can do with it, for example, on, uh, on Pinterest. Professionals, statistics, research, things about professional use when it comes to digital heritage of the continent of Europe. Looks like this. And here you can see that it's, it's about huge numbers as well. So, 28 countries, 23 official languages, over 50 million digitized items that can be used and reused from famous museums, from, from galleries, from, from archives, from libraries, you name them, um, with actually the basic idea that when you share things and things are accessible, it simply leads to use. So again, an active should be engaging, active, open, connected. And this is a way to prove it where it could lead to if you build platforms like this. So an example, an, an interesting example, I would say, and imagine what, would, what could happen if we treat it that way here in collaboration with all the federal and state archives, libraries, museums in Australia and create something like Europeana for our country here. That would be brilliant. That's why we position ourselves, the NFSA, um, in a relevant, distinctive and believable way um, as and based on this idea actually coming from an ABC television series about the Easy Beats. This is Mr. Albert, the famous uh, producer in the 60s, 70s, um, who heard the first part, or this is a television series obviously, but this happened in reality as well. He heard the first part of that famous song, uh, Friday on My Mind, and he said, guys, this is, this is you, this is the Easy Beat. Here we're talking about your own voice, this is how you position yourself actually in the country, and it's the sound from this country, and when I saw this, I thought, this, this is actually, this is what the clam sector is all about. We create our own voice, and it's the voice, it's the sound from this country, sound in, in, in the meaning of collective memory. So we position ourselves, when you talk about these things like collaboration, national centers of excellence, digitization, and so on, we are the only national agency concerned with the visibility, usability, and sustainability of Australia's artificial heritage. This is our job. This is what our official task is um, um, that is being set in our statutes and that the government asks us to do, and this is what we need to, um, need to do in the future as well. And it's not just presenting our things online, also on-site or off-site. You need to be visible, you need to be everywhere, you need to be present and um, accessible as an archive. So in every respect, an archive could play a role here and should play a role. Because this is what we do. We keep memories alive by telling stories with our archive. And it's not for nothing that this is the fourth presentation today that you see someone with a VR 
mask on because you know this is this is actually representing our, our collective memories at the future. Um, and to give you an example of why it matters to focus on new media and multimedia in the future, uh, this is a, the example of this is part of the first clip ever that was uploaded uh, at YouTube. This is called Me at the Zoo by Javed Karim, one of the founders of YouTube. And you can see it's been 13 years ago uh, that he was standing in front of a couple of elephants. Clip of, what is it, 18 seconds? Probably not very interesting. At the same time, 45 million views, but it's compared to uh, Psy in Korea, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing, it's peanuts. But again, it still exists. This clip, you can still see it on YouTube. It's the first clip, so it makes sense. This is an important clip, even when it's just a guy in st standing in front of elephants. This is an example from the Netherlands. And this is why the internet is not an archive, and we should be very, very careful of what we decide to be um, artificial heritage. This is a clip that was uploaded by a guy from um, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, um, just after the Charlie Hebdo killings in Paris, where he, a Muslim guy, said, you know, this is, this is really, really heavy. This is ridiculous. These lunatics, they ruined my religion. That is what he said. I'm a Muslim, but these guys, they ruined my religion. So this, this clip attracted a million views within a day in the Netherlands. And our curators, our digital curators, they saw that and they thought, well, something's happening here. This is important. Let's put it in our uh, catalog and make sure that we, for whatever reason, later on, we have it, at least we have it stored properly. Two days later, the account of this guy was withdrawn from the internet. You can see it over there. And it says, literally in Dutch, it says, due to violation of copyrights, which is ridiculous because maybe there was some music playing in the back when he was talking about his feelings regarding the Charlie Hebdo killings, but this was probably too hot, this topic, or whatever. They took it away without him noticing it, and luckily we had it in our collection in the Netherlands, so you can still see that clip through our collection, through our catalog, including all the metadata, including even the, the, um, the comments that were made when he uploaded this clip and so on. So it's still there. But you might say it's, it's been a lucky shot because if we wouldn't have done it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't exist anymore. So this is why it's important to focus on that part of what we would call artificial history as well. This is gaming. This is a, uh, it happens, uh, 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 an, an arena, a stadium full of people watching other people playing game. Just to, just to show that it's important. This is big. The uh, game industry is uh, as big as uh, the film and music industry together nowadays. Obviously, these are not real AFL players, as you can tell, <laughs> and not a real football soccer player at the right side either. But these guys are paid to play games on behalf of AFL clubs here in Australia or on behalf of, of my club in Amsterdam, Ajax. These guys will never touch a real ball, but they only do, the only thing they do is playing games for money. So it, it's big. The industry is growing. So this is my former working place in the Netherlands, and someone recreated that in Minecraft. It's happening. Uh, would we want to keep this? Yeah, we did it. But would we want to keep this? Yeah, probably. Um, maybe just to stress why it's important to preserve games. This is um, Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu, famous Mexican director who won an Oscar for his virtual reality film. And Oscar, you probably know it too for his virtual reality film called uh, Carne y Arena, Flesh and Sand. It's a seven minutes film immersed in, uh, in his film. You, you, you wear that mask and you even have to put off your shoes and walk through sand, literally, to get, to get the feeling what a refugee or, or um, um, a, um, um, a migrant has when he walks through uh, the desert between uh, Mexico and the USA. And he won an Oscar for that. And it's the first time that an Oscar was granted to something like this. And it means something. It means that it's, it's taken seriously, that it's an official medium, that it's even the Academy uh, Awards, things like that. So it makes sense to, to keep that for later purposes, like interactive documentaries. And again, it needs to be done in partnering, because at the end of the day, this is what we need to do. We future proof together the memory of Australia. Thank you very much. I can flip the screen. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's one point two. <laughs>
from me. <laughs> Trying to work out which one to ask. I've got quite a few. Um, okay. I suppose one, one of the really challenging things is you talk about collaboration and partnership and, you know, we can sign MOUs and so on, but yeah. what needs to happen to actually partner? Men it's mentality. It's culture, it's isn't it? And I was, I was so triggered by what I saw this morning, the Marco project, for example, and <coughs> it's what you said as well. They just do things, and please let's just do things here, and don't talk for ages about what the content of a memorandum of understanding would would be, even when it's important. I know, and again, we are all part of governments, of state or federal. And we have to be compliant and we have to follow rules, but you can also exaggerate it, I think, and a bit more risk appetite would be good just to try things and maybe fail sometime as well, but at least do things. It's that um, as the world is transforming, the kind of opportunities to access uh, all this material is transforming, it does require a, a cultural change in yeah. how we work. Yeah. And, and that is such a kind of fundamental yeah. challenge. And I think yeah. responsibility for each individual institution to think about how can we enable ourselves to partner well um, and then what can that, yeah. what can that foster? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, why do you think, like in the case of European Anna, you look at that, you know, you know 28 countries and, I mean... Ha well, I was actually, I was actually thinking if, if we made it with 28 countries and 23 different languages, why would, wouldn't one country with one language, okay, a lot of indigenous languages as well, but let's start with the official language. Why wouldn't we make it? It's doable. Even when Europeana took 12 to 15 years time to, to get where we are as well. Yeah. But then again, it needs to start somewhere. And Europeana started like a part of uh, the collection of the Royal Library in The Hague in the Netherlands, and it grew into something like this. So that's why I, come up with the, ex the um, example of what trove is here in Australia, why wouldn't we start there? It's mm. it, it, uh, there, is, there is a platform, there is material, it could grow into much something much bigger. We don't need to reinvent it all the time. A lot of things are there already, and that's, I think that makes sense too. That's, that's important to understand as well, that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Do things and, and see what's there already and make it work for a larger <laughs> scale, at a larger scale. And de-territorialise. Of course you <laughs> Okay, well, we're all going to explore some new territory now down in the light well and eat some lunch. Um, please thank uh, Jan Muller with me.